And, and today we're going to show you, we're going to start showing you how we can start doing that. It's going to be awesome today and next week because we don't do that naturally. So we're going to show you how we can do that. And we, as we start looking at our life through faith, because there's two ways. Generally, when it comes to life, there are two specific ways, general ways, that we, that we can look at life, okay? Because they kind of fit into these categories. We can look at life and, and the future through a lens of fear or a lens of faith. Fear is we're nervous, we don't know what's going to happen, things are just kind of up in the air, you know, there's, there's worry, there's anxiety, or we can have faith. And faith means this, that you know it's going to turn out okay. What we're going to show you is that the way we know it's going to turn out okay is not because we're so good, because let's admit we're not, but it's because God is that good. Hello, Bezel T3. That was Pastor Juan Vasquez of Unleashed Church in Tucson, Arizona. I find myself again in Tucson, Arizona this week, and as I go to the airport every day, I drive by Unleashed Church and was, of course, curious in just what kind of a sermon you will hear at a church that calls itself Unleashed. This particular sermon was given at the beginning of 2017 as part of a series called Destiny and is entitled, What You See Is What You Get. Now in the info section, we are told that the primary text is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. And talking about this new series called Destiny, becoming what God created and intended for us to be. Because I believe that God has created each and every single one of us on purpose and for a purpose. And God wants us to live out that purpose. But, but if you're here today and you're struggling, you're struggling with last year, you're struggling with some things that were in your life, maybe you're struggling with an addiction, you're struggling with something that's trying to keep you back over here, I want you to know that God, destiny means that there is something planned for you over here. And so what we're going to do is learn how we can, in, in faith, move forward day in, take a step day in and day out, moving forward to becoming the people that God created us to be. And that's, and I want to tell you, God wants you to have an amazing life. Amazing life. Amazing life. Well, no lack of energy there. Juan is pumped up, as most pastors who promote a New Year's reboot often are. Destiny, new beginnings, purpose, and an amazing life. Juan says that there is something planned for you over here, wherever here is, and you will have, all you'll have to do is learn how to move forward in faith towards all that God has for you. Now that it's July of 2017, I would want to ask those who heard this sermon, so how's God's destiny for your life working out for you so far? Now, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to cover all kinds of different topics through the series. We're going to talk about, you know, where we could be physically, where we, we, could be, we can be emotionally, where we can be spiritually, where we can be financially. There's a lot that we're going to be able to cover uh, through this series. But before we could get into the, the, the physical, here are the things to do. I, think, I believe we've got to step back and really focus on where our mind is before we get into the actual application of it. And here's the reason. Here's the reason. Is that if you get into the application of something without your mind being right. It's time to get your mind right. Clean the refrigerator. It's easy to quit. Okay. Me working out every January. All right. Every January, I'm like, I'm going to work out. I'm changing this. I'm going to start running every day. And then I run once. I go, oh, my knee's bad. I'm good. You know, but, but see, because my mind isn't ready for it yet. So what we do is, is that what we've got to do is if you can get your mind to be in the right place, then the physical stuff all falls in place. And that's what we're talking about today. Talk about have our mind and our heart and seeing things the way God wants us to see them. So if you see that the title for today's message is what you see is what you get. Ha! What you see, what you see is what you get. Now remember the premise, Juan is talking about where we can be physically, emotionally, spiritually, and of course, financially in 2017. And what Juan is saying is that if we can get our mind in the right place, we can be all those things we desire to be physically, emotionally, spiritually, and of course, financially. Very first point that we're going to talk about today is perspective is key. Perspective is key. And we're going to talk about the very first thing. And I actually put a quote right in the middle there. Okay. So I put something in your notes where it says this, 
that the number one thing that determines whether you are happy or unhappy, succeed or fail, grow or stay stagnant is how you look at things. It is your perspective. Now notice the verse he's using. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Now, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians is such a rich passage, but it has little or nothing to do with where we can be physically, emotionally, spiritually, and of course, financially in 2017 or any other year for that matter. Let's see what he does with that verse, and then let's dig a little bit more into the first 18 verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because I believe that... <clears throat> Everything that we will do and everything that we will become is all based on what we see. And I'm not talking about physically see, but I'm talking about vision, looking ahead. See, I've never talked to somebody who's successful, whether it's successful in business or whatever it is, that, and, and have them say, you know, and I ask them, how did you become successful? And they say, oh, you know what? I was just walking down the street, it fell, boom, and I was successful. You know, unless you're the Beverly Hillbillies that dug, you know, and struck and got, you know, oil. Listen to a story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up to the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil that is black gold, Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jeb's a millionaire. The kin folks said, Jeb, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. Many of you will not remember that 1960s sitcom, but I sure do. You know, the other, the other thing also is that perspective and faith, they're very much connected. See, God wants us that in our faith, in our relationship with him, he wants us to have a certain perspective, a certain idea of how we see the world. I actually put the, the verse right there in your notes. Okay. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 18. Listen to what God says here. It says, we look not at the things which are seen. You know why? Because the things that, are, that we see sometimes they can fool us. You know, the things that we see, sometimes those things, it looks very difficult, very overwhelming for us, but God is bigger than that thing. And oftentimes that thing that we see can, can mess, mess us up. Sometimes that thing that, that we see is so good and we start relying on that thing, that house, the car, whatever it is, and we forget that our reliance isn't on stuff because that stuff will all go away. Our reliance is on God. The stuff is something that God gives us to live on and live with, all right? So it says there, so, so it says, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, God is talking about two different perspectives to look at life. There's, there's the physical perspective that we can look at life, just the physical thing that's happening. And there's also the spiritual perspective to look at life, looking at things through the eyes of God. But, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about that as we, over the next two, three weeks, as we look at things through the eyes of God, it changes everything as physical stuff comes our way, whether good or bad, it really does change everything. Now, I'm glad that Juan said, whether good or bad things, but I'm puzzled by the words, looking at things through the eyes of God. I mean, is that even possible to look through the eyes of God? But see, when it comes to that choice in life, okay, so every day when we get up and we're going to make the choice today, am I going to live in fear or in faith? You know that that's a choice you have to make for yourself each and every day? I can't make that choice for you. God won't make that choice for you. He gave us a thing called free will. See, you get to wake up every single day and make a choice. Today, what's going to be my perspective? Today, how am I going to view that thing that comes into my life? Am I going to look at it from my limited perspective? Or am I going to step back and look at it from God's perspective and know that things are going to be okay? Okay, I think I'm tracking, Juan. For the Christian, things are going to be okay. But the question is, when are they going to be okay? And just how are we to define okay? See, and the way we can move forward with confidence is this. It's not confidence in ourselves. It's confidence in the promise of God, which is the next thing there on our notes. It says there, and this is for all of us, for all of us, God gives us a promise. Do you know that? That God gives every single one of us a promise. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, if you're a Christian, God says that he wants you to have the life that he intended for you to have. Jesus Christ paid the, the, the price for you so that your sin has been washed away and now you can move forward in your relationship with God the way God intended for you to be. So Juan, are you saying that the promise God gives Christians is that he wants you to have the life that he intended you to have? Well, what life is that, Juan? Christ died so that you can move forward and be the way that God intended you to be? 
To be what? If you're not a Christian, God invites you to that. Jesus Christ died for you as well. And God says, I'm giving you an open invitation to accept that gift so that you can live the life of purpose that I have for you. Okay, so you're telling me that Christ died for any and all unbelievers so that they can live the life of purpose that God has for them? I mean, I, I guess they have to come to faith, of course, of their own free will. Well, that sounds odd in light of Romans chapter 9, where we read, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Now, now track with me here. If indeed there are vessels of wrath as opposed to to vessels of mercy, then how can one say that Christ died for everybody in order for them to live a life of purpose unless he is saying that some unbeliever's purpose is to be vessels of wrath that will make known the riches of God's glory for the, the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. And a great illustration of, of people that did it right and some people that did it wrong are the Israelites. You know, if you go back and look at the Israelites in the Old Testament, we're going to spend the next, you know, I think at least four weeks looking uh, at the Israelites in the Old Testament. These were God's people and God gave them a promise. God gave them a promise that said that they, he was going to rescue them from captivity. So if you look in, in the book of, uh, of Exodus, you see that God rescues them out of captivity from Egypt. They were there for 400 years. So what I thought was going to be a sermon focusing on 2 Corinthians chapter 4 turns out to be a sermon on Numbers 13 and the story of God telling Moses to send out spies from each tribe to scope out the land that God well, was already promising to give them. Then he makes the point that he's been making about the importance of perspective. You know, the 10 spies saying that the people there are huge and there's no way we can take them on, as opposed to Joshua and Caleb who said, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land. Now, don't get me wrong, perspective is important. I'm not diminishing that fact. But before I take you back to where we should be in 2 Corinthians, let's hear the upshot of Juan's sermon. They forgot to look back. So for, for right now, what I want to do is I want to end off before we get into communion. And today, again, is a special weekend. We're going to do a communion weekend today. We're so excited about that. Uh, but before we get into that, I want us to take a step back because I believe that's what they forgot. All right? They forgot to look back at what God has done, which is the, the next thing there on your notes. Take a look back before moving forward. They forgot all about the miracles. They forgot about the parting of the Red Sea. They forgot all about the plagues that God, that God did just to help them escape from captivity. They forgot all about this amazing stuff. And what happened is because they forgot all about that, they then did not move forward in faith. You know, let's just go back and remember what God has gotten us through because God is so awesome. Guys, we have had so many baptisms here. We had so many people come to God through Unleashed Christian Church. It is just absolutely amazing. Some of you this year gave your life to Jesus, and I, we love that. You know, again, we love seeing people take that next step in their relationship with God. In November, I announced and I came up, and I'm like, guys, we're in a very tough, tight situation in November. And what happened was this, is that our loan was due. The balloon was due on our loan for the building. And the bank wanted a little, a little over $500,000 from us. And I'm going, <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm looking going, okay, there's the Egyptian chariots. There's the water. I don't know what we're going to do. It seemed hopeless. I'm going, okay, God, I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know what's going to, and so I came up, you know, and I explained to you guys, guys, here's what needs to happen. Please pray about it. Please pray about it. You know, that this refi happens. It, it was due in September. Remember, I came to you in November because in September they gave us an extension and things were looking pretty good on this extension for, th they give us a 90 day extension. And so, so we were getting ready and the extension ended on December 1st and we're end of November going, <laughs> Now, we did all of our due diligence. We're working with the banks. We're trying to go through it all. The week of December 1st, the refi happened. How awesome is that? I mean, God is so good. God is so good. So that's the thing is God has gotten us through some amazing uh, places. But I got to tell you, that's just the beginning of what God's going to do. That's just the beginning. I'm looking at 2017 with anticipation and excitement. I really believe that there's bigger and better days ahead. I believe that with God, the best hasn't happened. The best is yet to come, both in our individual personal lives, but then also in the church. So with Juan's best intentions, I'm sure, the perspective he is teaching is focused on the here and now. And folks, I don't want to downplay the here and now. It's important. 
but not in comparison to what is eternal. Now, let's go back to that 2 Corinthians chapter 4 passage and allow Pastor Ron Svensson to share some thoughts and lead us through that passage in a way that will make sense and help make my point. Now, it's only the audio, but it's so worth hearing. So hang in there. He's preaching on chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, verses 1 through 18. Have you ever sat with someone who is dying and not been able to say a word and not know what to say? Or perhaps you have tried to talk to someone about Jesus only to have them turn you off and to reject you. Or you have uh, put tremendous effort into some type of work within the church, a service to God, only to find yourself at the end depressed and empty? In loving Christ church, have you ever felt like you might, might break? Like a clay jar teetering on the edge of a shelf. Now Ron is going to provide the necessary context for what Paul says in chapter 4, verse 18. He begins by saying that we are, as Christians, clay pots or jars, common and easily broken. And yet, within those clay jars is an invaluable treasure. Here the picture then would be that Christians hold the treasure of the glory of God in the new covenant. They hold the treasure of the knowledge of the glory of God. They hold the treasure of the gospel in themselves. But either way, we don't have to choose. The treasure, the attraction is never us. That definitely is the metaphor. Uh, it's always the treasure. His treasure is in clay pots for a purpose so that the all-surpassing glory may not go to people or to the church or to pastors or anyone else, but may go to God. Remember that Paul in his letters to the Corinthians has been addressing some issues that were occurring in that church. And he has to defend his apostleship and what is important in the Christian life. You know, the super apostles that were around saying, <clears throat> Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, they were impressive. You know, they, they were the ones that, that put on the show. And Paul, admittedly, was not impressive. So the question was, how can something as great as the gospel of Jesus Christ come from someone as unimpressive as Paul? Paul says that we are common clay pots that contain a great treasure. Notice there are four but nots in verse 8 and 9. Four but nots. The Greek is emphatic, and so it means by no means, but by no means is that the end of the story. As one person put it this way, we are squeezed but not squashed. We are bewildered but not befuddled. We are pursued but not abandoned. We are knocked down, but not, not knocked out. That's the way what Paul is saying here. God had taken Paul through it all. And he will do the same for you, Christian. Now that's what we need to hear, is it not? The Christian life is neither all victory and moving to the next level of prosperity, nor is it defeatism and always being beat down. It is a mixture of both. Both troubles will come, and when they do, we need to remember that phrase, but not, or in no way are we forsaken. But Paul, I think, is saying even more than that with this imagery of taking on Christ's death and life. And even in his service of Christ, he knows what it's like in a sinful world. He's saying the same thing. He's fighting against the same forces that put Jesus on the cross. He's fighting against this present evil age. And we're, if we're going to serve Christ, are going to face that too. We're going to have to die to ourselves. We're not dying for other sins as Jesus died for us, but we're dying because of other sins in some way, shape, or form. And since we serve Christ, we must be willing then to, to crucify ourselves. We must be willing to be hard-pressed and perplexed and, and persecuted at times and knocked down sometimes to be weak to be clay jars. You know, it's so refreshing to hear a pastor preach what's actually in the text. 
See, Juan, like so many other pastors, when preaching a series such as Destiny, will pick and choose passages that fit what it is he wants to convey. But using 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 as an intro to talk about God wanting us to have an amazing life, well, that lifts the passage completely out of its context and robs it of its true meaning. Here we have the assurance of the treasure. Paul starts to speak of his faith here. He quotes from Psalm 116. He's showing him the motivation, the assurance he has. What keeps Paul going and dying and carrying the cross and, and speaking? It's his faith, his faith in the promises of God, his faith in the mighty work of God. And so we see three assurances given uh, in verses 13 through 15. Uh, that we keep going because we know that because Christ rose from the dead, we're going to rise from the dead someday soon. That was his first assurance. As he says in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. We are united to Christ, and because he rose in history, we will rise in the future. We will have a resurrected body, not a resurrected, a body that we have now that is resurrected. It will be our body, Scripture tells us, but it will be a glorified body. And this cannot not happen. And so we find assurance for dying to self and being a clay jar. You know, nowhere does Juan talk about our true home after we die or when the Lord returns. His sermon was all about this life in the here and now. But Christians, this life is not where our hope lies. As I write these words, okay, I am traveling home on an airplane going the speed of Mach 0.78 and an altitude of 36,000 feet. There's no guarantee that I will see tomorrow or that you will. But so much of today's Christianity simply ignores that fact. Look at the second one in verse 14. We will be brought into the very presence of God. He doesn't just talk about resurrection. He talks about being presented to God, totally perfect in Christ, what we call glorification. He talks about it in Ephesians 5 when he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish. What a glorious hope the Christian has in Jesus Christ. And then look at his third motivation in verse 15. We will experience the overflow of God's praise and glory as we see people saved in every generation, everywhere in the world, that his grace will reach out to people through us and through the church we're a part of and through Christ's people everywhere. And this also motivates us and assures us and keeps us dying and serving and speaking and loving and caring. See, your purpose and mine is to be a container of God's treasure, a container of his grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are to pour it out to others so that God might save them. We are to pour out the love of God on those with whom we live and work and hang out with and with those we worship with to encourage them and build them up in the faith. And now in this third point in verses 16 and 17 and 18, we find something of Paul's conclusions about this. What's this, his conclusions about the treasure? In verse 16 and 17 and 18, he sets before us a mindset You've got to get this mindset. It's an outlook that he has on life. Now here, both Juan and Ron are talking about perspective. But listen to the difference between the reason for the perspective. Ron is talking about what Paul is talking about, an eternal perspective that focuses on the glory to come. Juan is focusing almost entirely on this life here and now. My hope for all of us, what I want as your pastors for all of us to reach the promise of God in our life, whether it's in our relationships, whether it's in our finances, whether whatever it is, 
ultimately, all of us in heaven, we are to to have a a futuristic perspective. We are to have an eternal perspective, it's oftentimes called. And this perspective comes in, in, in three ways, verses 16, 17, and 18. In verse 16, we are to see ourselves as being people who are renewed every day. And therefore, we don't give up. Our outward life and our inward life. Outwardly wasting, inwardly renewed. Now, what does Paul mean by that? See, Ron says that Paul is talking not just about getting older and falling apart physically, but more likely the weakness of all we are in both body and soul living in this present evil age. The inner part is our participation in God's new creation that is even now breaking in to this present evil age. Now look at verse 17. The mindset is put out here a little differently because now he brings up our troubles. And each of us have troubles. Uh, Financial problems, relationship problems, you name it. We have troubles. And how do you view your troubles? Are they signs that God is against you? Are they signs that God hates you? Are they indicators that you just don't measure up after all? Is that how you view your troubles? You know, it's kind of like looking at this life through the bifocals of faith. We look down and we see our troubles with that up close part of the lens. But we look up and see the bigger view of the coming glory of God for us that is ahead of us. Or or do you think of your troubles as just something that, that happened, just stuff happens? None of those are Christian perspectives. Paul says that, that our troubles are light and momentary. Now, you might say, my troubles aren't very light. You don't know my troubles. They're, they're heavy. Speak for yourself, Paul. Speak for yourself, Ron. But they're light. Take it in context. Light in comparison with the weight, literally, weight of glory that awaits us. They're passing in comparison to the eternal glory that's just around the corner. And so our troubles prepare us for glory. That's what they're doing. That's why Paul says they're achieving for us or preparing for us. They give, the troubles give us an opportunity to make a comparison. Troubles wake us up to the fact that everything, including our bodies, is passing away. Now, last week while I was driving in Tucson, I was listening to some contemporary Christian radio, which I rarely do, and I heard a song by Switchfoot called Afterlife. I want it all, and I want it now. I want to come alive now. (laughs) They make it sound like the afterlife is simply an afterthought. But in reality, it's what the Christian should always have in their minds. You know, it's the fact is, it's the pastor's job to prepare people to die, to die to self and to actually die and transition from this world into the next. And Jesus says the same thing that Paul has been saying in this passage we've been looking at. Jesus in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and with the holy angels. And then now thirdly in verse 18, a third part of the mindset, we fixate upon the future. That's what verse 18 is saying. We focus not on the seen but the unseen, not on the now but the coming not on this world before Christ returns, but in the world after Christ returns. And so the scene is is something that is, one one of my friends would say, it's going to go bye-bye. It's going to go bye-bye. It's going to be gone. But the unseen will never stop. 
being seen. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite quotes from him is that whatever is not eternal is eternally out of date. I love that. Whatever is not eternal is eternally out of date. You know, the last video I did on Flatirons Church, I was criticized by probably a couple members who pointed out how much good Flatirons Church does uh, socially, you know, how much they reach out to the community and do this and that. Well, the thing is, there are lots of non-Christian groups that do the same thing, and that's wonderful. In fact, even Christians can come alongside non-Christians in common goals for the social good, you know, to fight against abortion or to feed the hungry or whatever it might be. But only Christianity can offer eternal life through the preaching of the gospel. This is what it's all about, folks. So Paul, one more time, 2 Corinthians, this is chapter 4, now verse 11. I close with these words once again. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so, in conclusion to all this, for now we are clay pots, but the treasure is yours. Now we are pressed and perplexed and persecuted and pushed down, but we're never defeated. Now, now we're dying to self, but we're seeing God bring life through us and through his church, through people who love other people. For now we're wasting away, but the resurrection renewal has come and it will be completed soon. For now we have our troubles, and that's not to minimize them. They're hard. We now have our problems, but they're nothing compared to what is just around the corner for us. So lose heart, give up, never. Are you kidding? Why would we do that? No, we fixate upon the future, our future.